Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Portland Art Museum. Thank you all for coming today on such a beautiful afternoon in Portland and for navigating the parade. I think we waited just a couple more minutes in order for, for people to make it. My name is Don Urquhart. I'm the director of collections and exhibitions here at the museum. And for the last year, I've been working with Michael Lambacher to bring this exhibition to Portland here today. Many of you will know that over the course of a year, the museum presents sometimes as many as 20 exhibitions. Uh, the next year is very exciting. You will see amazing bicycles and beautiful sculptures by Gaston Lachaise. Come back in the fall and see samurai warriors and contemporary Northwest art. Then see the splendors of Venice and impressionist paintings from Paris and monumental sculptures from the Tuileries Gardens of the Louvre. All of these projects uh, over the course of the year are only possible with the very generous support of our many friends and donors. This project in particular is possible only because of the presenting sponsorship of Provenance Hotels, lead sponsorships from Cycle Oregon, Wells Fargo, Helen Joe and Bill Witzel, Nutcase, and many, many others who made it possible to ship these bicycles halfway across the planet to install them in such a wondrous and beautiful way in our galleries to partner with designers and builders and collectors locally to show new bikes in our lobbies every week, like the Renovo and the Trek that you saw when you came in, to schedule programs all summer long, some unusual bike rides and some uh, tours of the city. I hope you'll go to our website and pick out some programs and come back and visit over the course of the summer. And of course, to bring Michael M. Bacher and his lovely wife, Sean, to Portland here today. Thank you for coming. I first met Michael in Vienna. It was January, January, and it had been snowing for two days, and airports across Europe were closing down. It had snowed about 18 inches, I think. The sidewalks were covered, and the streets were covered. And he picked us up at the hotel, and I, could, I had trouble finding his car. It's not because the snow was so deep, but because his car was so small. Maybe it was seven feet long and weighed 500 pounds. And I sort of piled myself into it, and we plowed through the narrow, snow-covered streets of Vienna, and it was an adventure. And I remember thinking at one point, Michael, I wished you'd collect snowmobiles or heavy trucks. <laughs> but I hadn't seen your bicycle collection yet. When Michael's not riding his bicycles, and he rides every one of them, but when he's not riding them, he stores them in the attic of an old building outside the museum quarter in Vienna. And we climbed these, these five stories of stairs and pushed our way through the attic door and discovered the most amazing sight. It was under the roof line. The roof of old timbers made this triangle, and there was old wooden planks making sort of a boardwalk. And the sides of the room were lined with rows and rows of bicycles of every color and shape and style and design. It was. It was a pretty amazing moment, but it only lasted for a second because right away, Michael walked up to a bicycle and pulled it out and started pointing to a detail that he loved about a funny crank or a poorly designed brake or a handlebar that he'd never seen anything like before. And it was then that I learned he has this great appreciation for detail. He knows each one of these bicycles intimately and he loves them. He handles them not like a museum conservator or a curator, not the way we would normally handle art, a little bit the way a painter handles a painting, but mostly the way a rider handles a bicycle. He loves and knows these bikes very, very well. When we left his attic, his storage area, we went to his apartment, and it was a beautiful, beautifully designed spot. I remember above the table, the red pocket beatsy, the bicycle that's folded and mounted on a wall here, was hanging like a sculpture, and there were drawings and photographs laid out, and Michael started to share with us his idea for the exhibition. Now, Michael had never been to Portland, he'd never seen the museum, and he didn't know our galleries, but he had this vision of how our audience would see the bicycles in our gallery. They would see them floating, suspended from brake cables, suspended by this um, steel tube that wound through the gallery like a wet noodle, and it was, a, it was a difficult thing to imagine, but we'd known the projects he'd worked on. He's worked with Chris Burden. He's worked with Vito Acconci. He's done many great museum exhibitions. We've seen his app, which I think is perfect, and his book is excellent. 
And if you brought your book, or if you buy a book this afternoon, I think Michael might sign it in the coffee shop after this lecture. But we left Vienna having total confidence in his design, and with this fun challenge of designing this noodle to run through the galleries. So we bent all of the aluminum here in Portland. This is on Columbia Way. And for the next several months, just went back and forth choosing bicycles and choosing designs and lighting and, and, and different ways to mount these things. And the result, I think, was excellent. Working with Michael, first meeting Michael and seeing his appreciation for detail was, was excellent. But then collaborating with him on this and learning his great sense of space, how an object fits in a space, how a person moves through space, and how they can relate to our galleries. He's got a really excellent gift for understanding that, and his vision for this project was perfect. Michael, it was a real pleasure working with you on this. Everyone on the team had a great time, and I'm so happy our audience gets to see your collection. I know they're eager to hear from you now. So without further ado, would you please welcome Michael Embacher. Thank you, Don, for this overwhelming introduction. In introduction. My English is not very good. I need my papers. Thank you for understanding. Um, dear friends of cycling, as Arthur Cannon Doyle, the event of Sherlock Holmes, so aptly put it at the end of the 19th century, when the spirits are low, when the day appears dark, when the work becomes monotonous, when hope hardly seems worth having, just mount the bicycle and go out for a spin down the road without thought on anything but the ride you're taking. Even if you're not feeling depressed or hopeless, hopeless, bicycling has many advantages and especially nowadays fascinate both young and old. It's not the only CO2 friendly and political correct. Cycling has become a lifestyle statement. The bike path is a kind of catwalk. In 2008, the highly style conscious Sofia Coppola had the model Marina Lichuk cycle through Paris for a Dior advertisement. Dior led the way and other fashion labels soon followed. Whether Benetton, Diesel, Lacoste, suddenly all of them discovered the world of the bicycle. In one of the latest advertising campaigns, the Italian cult brand Tots presented a close-up of cognac collared leather booties on a model by riding a bike, and the German photographer Jürgen Teller made the spokes of his own part, of his own bike part of his campaign photos for Mark Jacobs. Fashion and bicycling have more in common than you might think. Cycling blocks are now just as popular as fashion blocks. Cycling fashion designers are a trend. The British fashion designer, Sir Paul Smith, wanted just one thing, to become a racing cyclist, but a serious accident at the age of 17, followed by months in hospital, put a sudden end to this wish. One thing survived. Up to the present day, he has remained a passionate hobby cyclist, and as such, he wrote the foreword of my book, Cyclopedia. But it's not only Paul Smith the argumentative, politically active fashion designer Vivian Westwood's favorite way of traveling around London is by bike. Has the bicycle replaced the motor car as a status symbol? In Europe's creative saying, this is certainly the case. Or to put it in words of a wise politician, a developed country is not necessarily a place where the poor have cars. It's where the rich ride bicycles. <laughs> And so we in Europe are rediscovering the bicycle as a means of transport. After following the economic boom of the 1950s, it had almost completely disappeared from the streets. Today, people cycle not because they can't afford a car, because, but because they cons consciously decide to do so. For Europe, it's certainly true that cycling has become an attitude to life and the bike is now an object of desire. This trend has led to an entire chain reaction. For bike-friendly urban communities, the best-known manufacturer of denim developed a special kind of bike jeans, the Levi 511 computer jeans, are water-repellent and dirt-resistant. When the leg ends are, 
are turned up of the jeans re reveal integrated scotch light reflective tape. And at the rear, the waistband is higher to protect the lower back when cycling. They have slim fit cut. <laughs> Therefore, they are not for more solidly built among us, but then, as we know, cycling helps to slim you down. <laughs> While it's true that the bike courier culture complete with Satchel was born in New York, I've convinced myself in the last few days that Portland surpasses everything. <laughs> and exemplary... <laughs> An exemplary cyclist city. Bikes can be taken free of charge on the metro. There are more than 90 miles of bike paths and further 50 miles are to be added annually. The bicycle boulevards or the neighborhood greenaways, as they now called, extend through the entire city. Motorists leave lanes for cyclists. Parking spaces were sacrificed to erect 1,200 bike stands. And there is even a floating bike path on the river, not to mention the right of of way at many junctions. Clearly, public opinion here believes that every additional cyclist raises the quality of life in the city. Also for motorists, happy Portland. <laughs> in contrast, Vienna presents itself as a bike-friendly city, but as far as appropriating the road is concerned, motorists know no mercy. Street traffic is dominated by brutality, selfishness, and aggression. Everybody wants to get their own destination quickly. Nobody forgives anyone else a mistake. And everyone is frustrated in some way or other. Road users transform into jungle animals. Instead of civilized, form, civilized forms of behavior, people drum on their chest and roar. <laughs> Perhaps this is due to lack of respect or the fact that politicians often just pay lip service to ecological means of transport. But I do have hope for the future. Since the new urban government took office, a number of things have changed. Whatever perspective you approach to the theme of the bike from, whether as a cycling activist, blogger, or just a bike rider, whether sporting or leisurely, a do-it-yourself handyman, or even a professional bike builder, the bicycle has enthusiastic fans everywhere. If physical mobility is one of the most, is one of the important requirements for freedom, then, as historian Eric Hobsbawm said in 2002, the bicycle is the most important single invention since Gutenberg, Gutenberg that serves, as Mark put it, to fully develop human abilities and the only one without any obvious bad side effects. As a collector, bicyclist, and architect, for me, the fascination lies in the simplicity of the idea. It's the simplest translation of human energy into maximum mobility. It is and remains the most efficient method of transportation on Earth. And in times of energy efficiency and environmental compatibility, also one of the most sustainable products. It allows the purest experience of the landscape and the body. And that's not all, cycling is great fun. And somehow or other, it is a very democratic product. Unlike with a car, the price is not the important thing. Even reasonable priced bicycles are very beautiful. But the bicycle isn't just a means of getting around or a piece of sports equipment. It's also a manifestation of human creativity and clever ideas. It's an example of wonderful handcraft and design. Although the principle of the bicycle has been in existence for more than a century, during which time it regularly underwent rapid change, the criteria of construction have remained unchanged. The bike is one of the most uncompromising constructions that I know. It must be light, as the rider always has to move their own weight of the construction. Yet, it must also offer great stability as any form of instability means lack of efficiency. This is a film of Jacques Tati. I don't know if you know him. He's a comedian, of, a French comedian of the 50s. And in many of his films, he has a bicycle. Just a moment.
Pull. Oh, what's that? Oh, over here. And although enormous forces are involving in cycling, most bicycles are extremely graceful and elegant constructions. With great personal commitment, bicycle designers throughout the world invest innumerable hours in perfecting pro the product bicycle using all the talents and cleverness. I like to travel by bicycle. I use my bike for work travel, to visit building sites and to go to meetings because on the one hand it's very practical and on the other hand, I enjoy it. At the weekend with my wife, I like to ride our tandem and we enjoy the landscape around Vienna. But we never take part in a bike race and I never will. The fact that my figure is not exactly streamlined alone would prevent me from doing this. <laughs> Nor I am a militant proponent of the bicycle. I accept people who don't want to cycle because they find it too dangerous or simply don't, they don't like it. I'm not a bicycle historian, and I'm also not a typical curator or collector. I really am not an expert. My job is a completely different one, but I love bicycles because I find the product most appealing, and as I have lots of bikes, I have become inquisitive. Perhaps my p passion for bikes began, began with an unfulfilled wish from my early days. At the tender age of 14, I dreamed having a Buch racing bike with Campagnolo gears. It stood, financially unobtainable, in a window of a local bike shop. I must confess, I was delighted to be able to acquire a bike of this for my collection about four years ago. However, however before I began to collect professionally, it w I was like a lot of you. Whenever a bike of mine was stolen, I bought a new one. As the thefts became more frequent, I decided to buy only used ones. By chance, a few years later, I saw on a, on web a fantastic bike, a Ricci, and I acquired it. You see, the saddle post is uh, the saddle tube is divided because it's uh, small. Um, that was the start. After this purchase, I received congratulation on this good buy for bike from bike collectors. I didn't know along with confirmation that this bicycle was a wonderful and a very rare piece. This awaked my curiosity, which began to develop a life of its own. With every new acquisition, I rep repeatedly recognized how many different bicycle construction and technical details are actually involved in bike design. Naturally, building up a bicycle at collection depends to an extent on what the mark market offers. I approached my collection in a very naive way. I didn't look for particular models, I just bought what I could find. And what I could find, what I regarded as interesting or exciting. Therefore, my collection grew more or less according to chance. For me, the driven force was a naive curiosity. But precisely this naive curiosity proved me to be my good fortune, as this enabled me to find interesting collected pieces about which neither I or many other of my fellow collectors had even heard anything before. Believe me. A journey becomes more interesting the more you allow yourself to be surprised by the things that you meet along the way, instead of pursuing certain prefined ideas. My collection is not based on a certain concept. It is neither chronologically complete, nor do I wish to categorize it. Instead, it offers a broad spectrum of what a bicycle can be and what story each model can tell. My collection is a very subjective selection, as the playful, experimental, and creative elements of a bike are just as important to me as the role as it, it has played in history or the riders that rode it. It may not be the greatest nor the most important role. Perhaps every bicycle in my collection could be replaced by a finer one or one in a better condition. But that was never my theme or my aim. Presenting a wide variety was always more important to me than the perfection of the individual parts. The fact, nevertheless, the collection contains many prototypes and valuable bicycles is due to a combination of curiosity I have already referred to, luck and the great enthusiasm with which I pursue my hobby. 
I collect everything that's out of the ordinary, racing bikes with particular fine details, folding bikes with strictly clever mechanisms, or those that fail in a particular significant way, touring bikes produced with particular care, even if admiring them at rest is preferable of riding them. <laughs> racing bikes without brakes that are reduced to pure speed. And then there are a sizable group of bikes which even with the best will in the world cannot be allocated to any particular category. Due to my profession, I see the bike as a design object that satisfies my curiosity about construction, individual design, and technical solution, as well as the sheer inventiveness of humanity. I'm particularly impressed by the technical innovative strength shown by a bicycle, the principle of efficient design. Despite the enormous forces involved, most bikes are extremely graceful and highly elegant construction, and this elegance becomes particularly evident when the bicycle is in motion. On account of this, many, many mechanical parts a bike must be made with the greatest precision, so as to keep any possible friction loses the drive until as a whole to an absolute minimum. I see the bicycle as a technical miracle, a fascinating object of study for a designer, and yet it is practically impossible to cap comprehensively the document the phenomenon bicycle, as there, as there are innumerable differences. Hardly any other product offers nearly as many design possibilities. And despite all the technical sophistication, a bicycle is often a botch object with, many, with which many individualists have attempted to meet their individual requirements. Even in some cases, this has meant that its use was somewhat limited. I try to find bikes on the one hand offer a usual degree of precision and perfection, the Lotus Sport with which Chris Boardman wrote the world record, for instance. On the other hand, bikes that individualists have made for themselves, such as the ice bike. I am impressed by personalities who, in fact, had nothing to do with bike building, but who were infected by bicycle virus and became involved in experimenting with construction. This often led to very successful construction, which at the first glance have nothing to do with Sander bike. This is a bike prototype by PC, TC. I'm equally astonished by people who time and time again attempt to reinvent the bicycle and to develop completely new frames and shapes or technical solutions. Like for instance, the PMP crank or the Colwood crank handle in both these cases, the inventor attempted to overcome the dead point in pedaling. In both cases, unsuccessfully. <laughs> but nevertheless, sufficiently inventive for a patent. I think they look fantastic, don't you? In contrast, there is no place in my collection for bicycles that have an unusual form just for the sake of design, without any technical or constru constructural reason. Naturally, I'm particularly delighted by bicycles in which world-renewed designers examine this theme. For instance, Richard Zappa and his Zoom bike made of featherweight aluminum sections. With pride, I can say, all my 210 bikes in the attic are completely ready for ride, for short test rides or for long excursions that are part of an architect's everyday visit to the building site. For me, the chance to occasionally use strange models and experience the difference between them as an enjoyable part of everyday life represents a great luxury. After telling you so much behind the idea of my, of my collection, I'm sure you would like to see some of the individual models. I've already mentioned Richard Zappa's Zoom bike. I'm not sure. I'm sure I don't have to introduce Richard Zappa creator of numerous design icons to you. Born in Munich and resident in Milan, he first worked for, for the architect Gio Ponti and later with Marco Zanuso. His clients include well-known firms such as Alessi, Artemide, and, and, and Unifor, IBM, Heuer. His product designs are represented in many museum collections in the MoMA in New York, as well as in the Victoria Albert in London. He's not developed beautiful 
it not de only developed beautiful functional objects. At the start of his career, Richard Zapper began to take an interest in transport problems. He worked with Fiat on experimental cars, above all on the development of pneumatic bumpers. In 1972, together with architect Ceolenti, he set up a working group to study new urban transport systems. He developed this time in the, in the framework of an exhibition at the 16th Triennale in Milan in 1979. There he presented a project for a bus for Fiat on which the passenger could keep their bikes in a special stand. Now it's use in Portland. You can already see the direction in which his ideas were heading. Before he ventured up to, this, to, to the design of Zoombike, he made comprehensive studies. He examined efficiency of inner city travel routes and came to the conclusion that a combination of bicycle and public transport represented the ideal solution. He came up with the following, cycling to the nearest bus, streetcar metro station, folding a bike, and then getting up onto public transport getting off at your stop, unfolding the bike, and riding directly to your final destination. In 10 years, Sapper developed his featherweight folding bicycles. Bicycle. This is the patent. The folding mechanism is reminiscent of an umbrella, and it can be folded up just as quickly in one second. It was first used at the Frankfurt Auto Salon in 1989, as the journalist attending the straight fair had to cover enormous distance, distances when moving around the grounds, they were allowed to use Supper's Zoom bike. There are about 60 Zoom bikes. This well thought out model has not yet been produced in series. Although I've never con I had never contact with Richard Supper before, I invited him to come to Vienna for my first bicycle exhibition in 2006. I was even cheeky enough to call him at home. His phone number was in the Milan telephone book. And although I didn't expect him to, to answer, in fact, it was his wife, not to mention that he would come to Vienna, in fact, he did. Why? He wanted to know how I found his bicycle. Of the, of the 60s that were made, two are in private ownership. The remaining 58 are kept under lock and key by BMW. Nevertheless, I managed to acquire mine through eBay and in the... <laughs> and in the meantime, I have bought a second one from a collector who is a friend of mine. At the exhibition opening, I had the chance have to have a long chat with Richard Zapper, and I can only say that his personality fascinated me. He told me about his grandson, who was at the elementary school, where kids in the first class were given pictures to copy instead of examining things themselves. He said that this was completely the wrong way and does no encourage creativity. A small anecdote from his private life, he also talked about one of his wife's dearest wishes, a Jaguar Cabrio, a convertible from the 1940s, a beautiful car with a flowing, streamlined form. After eventually fulfilling her wish at her 65th birthday, the first trip they made in the car was from Milan to Rome. After an hour, it began to pour rain. And how else could it be after all these years? The convertible, convertible top was not watertight. Both luggage passengers got rather wet. But for supper and his wife, that didn't matter at all. They found that outstanding fantastic. People like that impresses, impress me. Everything doesn't happen to be perfect in order to enjoy yourself. Probably we are sometimes too pampered to see things simply. In, 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 Incidentally, he has made, he has a bike for me in Milan, a rowing bike called Rocker Bike, which he was given by a constructor who is a friend of his. Unfortunately, it's broken. There was a little accident. Richard Zappa wanted to drive it into his garage with a bike on the roof of his car. <laughs> but the garage door was a little bit too low. 
Another design I find extremely fascinating is Alex Moulton and his Moulton bicycles. We had the privilege of meeting him a short time before he died last autumn. For all, you, for all of you who did, know, did not know him, he was a born inventor, so to speak. He was the great grandson of Stephen Moulton, a pioneer in the field of rubber processing, who founded the business of George Spencer Moulton Limited in Great Britain. After the family business was taken over by Avon Rubber in 1956, Alexander Moulton set up his own firm, the Moulton Development. For the British Motor Corporation and later for Dunlop, he developed the idea of rubber suspension. Here, a major role was played by his friendship by Sir Alec Isigonis, the legendary BMC constructor whose best known creation was the Mini equipped with rubber su suspension elements. <laughs> the separable Moulton bicycle with its rubber suspension is, just like the Mini, a product of its time. The impetus for the development was pro provided by the first energy crisis of the post-war era, the Suez Crisis in 1956, which imposed pedal weight rationing in England. The economical Mini and the Moulton bi bicycle both responded to the fear of oil shortage that surfaced repeatedly. Both the Moulton bicycle and the Mini were presented in 1959 and both had a rubber suspension system as well as small wheels. With his bikes, Moulton embarked a new path in bike history in the 60s. Until this time, 60-inch high pressure tires and the full suspension for the bicycle did not exist. From that time onward, he tirelessly adapted and improved his bicycle. It became demountable, lighter, more filigree. Moulton bikes are multifunctional, something you don't notice at first glance. But races are one on them, they are used for shopping and to go on world trips. That's what their inventor, their inventor developed them for. Well-known designers, constructors and architects like Norman Foster appreciate the functionality and the design of these bikes. From them, Moulton's are design works of art, artworks that can deal with every kind of weather. And they are also to be found in museums. A Moulton hangs at the entrance of the MoMA in, 19, in, MoMA in New York. From 1958 to 1988, Alex Moulton was vice president of the Royal Academy of Engineering. For his services, he was named commander of the Order of the British Empire. My wife and I, had the honor to be invited to the celebrations marking the 50th anniversary of the firm in Bradford and Avon, a memorable experience. Not only the beautiful countryside of Cotswolds, but also the family home, Bradford and Avon. This is a photo of Alex House during the annual Moulton meeting. As you can see, visitors were allowed to camp in the lovely garden. The legendary hall, the production building, as well as the guests were most impressive. Despite being 92 and having health problems, Alex Moulton was still full of energy and he really enjoyed his celebration. Lord Norman Foster sent a greeting by video and Sir James Dyson, the famous vacuum cleaner manufacturer, allowed himself a discreet product placement. His shirt, he was wearing was exactly the same color of his new product, the space heater. I don't know who else noticed that, but this, but my wife and I immediately, as we are enthusiastic Dyson users. <laughs> Dyson admitted that he was strongly influenced by Moulton. He sees design prim primarily as a product of engineering, first the technology and then the appearance. It's not real. I'll, all that long since, many children regarded the profession of inventor as a dream job, like astronaut or racing driver. Today, you hardly ever hear this, and Dyson believed that, that this represents a major problem for Europe and the USA. In Korea, India, the Philippines, and the Iran, this job has a very different image. It is seen as an exciting profession. In England, people prefer to study medicine or social sciences or whatever, just nothing practical, it's his opinion. <laughs> Dyson also had a theory about this. When a country grows rich, it forgets the reason it became so prosperous. 
And then the aim is more to spend money than to ask yourself how to make money. He said when he brings a new product onto the market, he doesn't think about, he think, he doesn't think about not how much money he can make with it. Money never drove him, it was always the technology. Therefore, according to Dyson, engineering and design shouldn't be separated. This separation was a stupid invention of the 20th century, as he learned during his studies in the mid-60s. And on this account, in his business, Dyson doesn't employ a single designer, only engineers. Unfortunately, Dyson doesn't build any bicycles, but perhaps someday he will. Another impressive designer is Mike Burroughs and his Lotus 108. The bike designer who was born in 1942 achieved world renown above all with the Lotus Time Trial bike for Chris Boardman, with which he later won the, the gold medal at the 1992 Olympic Games. For a long time, Burroughs was involved in the design of recumbent bike. The wind Cheddar is extremely popular. More recent developments for two-wheeled recumbents are the Red Catcher, the Red Tracer and the Red Tracer B. In addition to recumbent bikes, he devoted himself to develop a folding bike as well as a cargo bike. In the 1990s, Boros worked mostly for Giant where he developed compact DCR street bike frames. Elements that are frequently found in his bikes are single arm forks and swing arms, some of which are spring-loaded. Today, Boros lives in Norwich, Great Britain. Designer Mike Burroughs and the Lotus Technican knew what that the new material carbon fiber called for new forms. And so they refined the monocoque frame on which Mike Burroughs had been working since the mid 80s, but at that time outside the rules that were currently valid. It was only in March 1992 that the UCI relaxed the strict regulation that applied to bike frames, opening the way for the Lotus 100. 108 bike and Chris Boardman to win a number of gold medals at the Olympic Games in 1992 in Barcelona and shortly later to break the world record for 5,000 meters. After this success on the racing track, the street version Lotus 110 was produced. At the 1994 Tour de France, Chris Boardman's record-breaking win on the Prologue gave him priced yellow jersey. As a race leader, and it was the first Briton ever to lead the classic event for two days. Boardman then went to win the gold medals in the 400-meter individual pursuit and the 42-time trial in the 1994 Cycling World Champions held in Sicily. To the delight of many, this version could also be bought by those willing to invest the price of a compact car into the bicycle. But one thing is certain, the collaboration between the independent constructor, uh, independent constructor Mike Burroughs and Lotus people produced a two-wheeler which equally shocked and delighted the specialist world and fans in 1992. To say that this introduced a new age of bike construction can be described as British understatement. It is fantastic when a new material becomes ready for the market and designers, constructors and producers then immediately start to work with. But you must also remember that Lotus is, in fact, best known for its cars. But we see that when true precision work and perfect, perfect design are employed to become world champion, even in a different kind of sport, then this can be achieved. One of the most interesting bikes in the collection is the Capo, because it represents a successful cross between an ice skate and a bicycle. At the back, a wheel with specially made spikes provides the drive. At the front, a runner is used to steer. An inclined position is here very helpful. The runner ensures absolutely directional stability, even where other bikes would certainly slide. But if, however, you do lose your grip and fall, then you need to display ag agility to avoid the spikes of the back wheel. However, in Austria, where it was produced, the ice bike has not, not met with wide acceptance, and the Viennese Capo company became known above all through its commuter bike. I was able to buy this artwork from an elderly Viennese gentleman. He told me that he and his wife often rode on like Neusiedlsee near Vienna when it was frozen. 
I want you to know what it is to, like to ride an ice bicycle and to try it out. On my first ride, I had a flat tire. As, like in all bikes, the back wheel had an air-filled tube. And so I set about fixing the puncture. And just imagine the second excursion brought me an experience of totally new kind. It was very cold and foggy. The ice covering noiselessly was a single white surface, it identical with a white sky. As I could not find the horizon, as felt, I felt as I was riding to infinity. This is probably what reincarnation looks like. <laughs> in my euphoria, I had trouble in finding my, back, my way back, as due to feeling of happiness between the white horizon and the airflow, I had completely lost my orientation. All I can say is that ice cycling is a fantastic feeling. As you see, I have some weak, uh, something of a weakness for unusual bicycles. Another one of my favorite bicycles is the PSI Paratrooper, a military bike developed especially for British Army parachutists in the Second World War. 60,000 of them were produced and they were actually used, for instance, on the legendary D-Day. The bikes were thrown out with their own parachute, which was fixed to the running wheel. That is to, to say the saddle and the steering wheel pointed downwards. They were extended as far as possible and only lightly screwed. Upon hitting the ground, they retracted into the saddle tube and the fork tube, which reduced the impact of the landing. Of course, this folding bike was still very ma massive, but without the folding frame, it would have hung on even more awkward way from the parachute. Smaller wheels would have handling the air in the air easier, but would have drastically reduced the bike's usability on the ground. The pedals that are moved by pedal cranks ensure that the bike takes up a very little packing space. Many of these paratroopers were rebuilt after the war. Two normal pedals were brought into the cranks, which naturally destroyed the bikes. I was fortunate enough to be able to buy an original PSA paratrooper from the pensioner in Sussex. And I can say that the riding experience is extremely good. The brakes are too are ex excellent, and this is a very much a bike that is suitable for everyday use with a unique history. Incidentally, BSA stands for Birmingham Small Arms. Here, the perfect link is established to the other products made manufactured by the firm. And when you think that you might have seen a modernist, modernized version of this bike somewhere, you, then you're perfectly right. In 1983, the fashion company Trussardi took up the idea and made out of the USA BSA Power Trooper a fine touring bike with all kinds of leather applications. From the nostalgic to the ultra-modern futuristic, the Bianchi C4. I've chosen this bike as a logo for my collection. as it is probably the most spectacular piece. The design reminds me strongly of Star Trek. For me, it represents a futuristic version of a bicycle, although its usefulness for everyday life is limited, as the braking surface on the disc wheels are lacking. You can imagine that this would be probably cause a certain difficulties in normal street traffic. In fact, it was developed by the Italian firm C4, but became known as a Bianchi C4 only when as you already tell from the name, the legendary bicycle manufacturer took it over. Eduardo Bianchi was found, SPA was founded in 1885 and is one of the oldest bicycle company in the world that still makes bicycles. C4 was founded one and 101 years later by Marco Bonfanti. The carbon frame without a saddle tube looks as if it has grown organically. Both flowing and muscular, it seems to point towards the lightweight future. And it was made with the help of technology that in the 80, 1980s was revolutionary. The NGC, no joint construction, allowed the production of hollow carbon structures without joints, which are unavoidable when connecting tubes. Saving weight by omitting could be a brief description of the principle. 
However, this was no longer so entirely new when C4 developed this frame at the end of the 80s. 100 years earlier, the Coventry machinist had experimented in their swift safety on frames without a saddle tube. Success soon arrived for the Bianchi C4. As early as 1987, the Bianchi team was able to compete in the Giro d'Italia with these bikes and was ahead of its time with the cardboard monocoques. The cooperation between Bianchi and C4 showed that often it is, it is collaboration between frame building and construction that celebrated success and achievement victories. Often companies borrow each other frames and construction and then issue the bike as their own. A good example of the fact that the frame is often disguised as a different product is offered by Masi Grand Criterium. On many frames made by Masi, there has been a different name. Valerio Masi, in younger days himself a racing cyclist, made his frames for a number of professionals, even when they were contractually tied to other producers. His frames were excel excellent to ride and particularly light, and when a professional didn't want to ride on another frame, then the Masi was painted in the color of a different make. At the start of his career, the famous racing cyclist Eddie Merckx rode a Masi, and that was disguised as a Peugeot by painting it. Team colleague Tony Simpson made the same choice. Rick van Lois Masi was painted as a superior, and Fausto Coppi, Jacques Anquetil, or Vittorio Adorni also insist on a Masi. We come to the end. Whether a racing bicycle, mountain bike, Holland bike, or simply recycling from rubbish tip, the bicycle means mechanical perfection. This quotation is not from me but from Ellen and Elizabeth West. As critics of our civilization, they are convinced that when humankind invented the bicycle, it reached the peak of its achievements. Here was product of the human brain that was completely beneficial for its users and caused other neither harm nor annoyance. Progress ought to be stopped when humanity invented the bicycle. This is, of course, not entirely the case. And so in conclusion, I only can say, as long as the bicycle exists, as long as people are interested in it, something will happen on our planet. I would like to express my thanks for the invitation to Portland. But first of all, I want also to thank my wife. It is not easy with me. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> oh, sorry. With her, a little Asian wisdom entered my life. Bikes are not quite so important to her, so we have enough time to talk, up, talk about other things at home. She allows me to be a little crazy, as she knows that this collection gives me enormous delight, and she is happy when I am happy. My thanks go to Brian. Since our first meeting in October, I was fascinated by the single-mindedness and the professional implementation of our joint idea. Thanks to Donald and Bruce and the whole entire team, with Matthew, Amanda, Beth, Stephanie, and, and, and. You were incredible. You all worked so wonderfully. You make it all seem so self-evident, and everything was shaped by warm atmosphere. It is really a joy to be here. I want to express my thank also to all the sponsors, trustees, and the board who had made this exhibition possible, especially to Susan and Jim Winkler. And last but not least, I want to thank my assistant, Itai. He's infected with the same enthusiasm than me, and he does a great job. Besides, he's an extremely pleasant and nice person. <laughs> Unfortunately, he could not join the opening, he had to leave to prepare the Vienna show in the Museum of Applied Art, which will open next week. And finally, two quotations to which there is nothing to be added. No less figure than Luca di Montezemolo himself outed himself as an absolute bicycle fan. He's the head of Ferrari. In answering a query from the German newspaper Die Zeit about what he best likes to do in his leisure time, Mr. Ferrari answered simply, I ride my bike. <laughs> and another motor car builder was also fascinated, fascinated by the bike 
In no other invention is the useful so closely combined with the pleasant as in the bicycle, said Adam Oppel. In this sense, carry on. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone, for coming to this talk. I hope you'll go back into the gallery, find a new detail or a new color or a new shape that you love, and also come to the uh, museum grounds coffee shop and say hello to Michael and maybe ask him to sign your book. Thank you. Thank you.